Welcome to Happy Path Programming. I'm Bruce Eckel. I'm James Ward. All right. Well, we're back after a little hiatus. Yes. I don't know. I think since the last time was I in the Bahamas and Scottsdale and um, got sick and, you know, and just all sorts too. of things. Yeah. That's right. Oh, and we had Winter Tech Forum. We had, oh, yeah. We had which, the Winter Tech Forum, which was, which was super fun. It was um, amazing. Had a bunch of people up here, had some great mm -hmm. conversations, and we recorded some, and we yes. may try to release some of those on the podcast. So Yes, that's the hope. Yeah. yeah. The, based on the quality, if they're if they're understandable, yeah. depends on the room we were in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when we were in the downstairs room, it was like almost a sound studio. Yeah. But so upstairs, a little, <clears throat> upstairs a little echoey, but it yeah. still might be listenable. Yeah. So we'll just, we'll have to look at those and yeah. decide how to do them. Yeah. So anyhow, today we have with us Holly Cummings, who is a senior principal software engineer on the Corcus team at Red Hat. Did I get all that right, Holly? You did. Yeah. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Um, I had seen, well, first, before we get into to that, um, I do want to talk about Quarkus. Uh, we'll we'll put that off till later. But I love Quarkus. I think it's such a great framework. Wait, tell me what it is. Oh, good. Do we want to go? Let's start with Quarkus. Yeah, sure. sure. Why not? Why not? We're there. Yeah, Holly. <clears throat> what is Quarkus? So the sort of the strap line for Quarkus is supersonic subatomic Java, um, which is just a way of saying without actually saying it's really light and it's really fast. Um, so what another thing that we sometimes describe it as is cloud native Java. So it's really trying to bring Java up to date for you know the, the decade that we're in because Java is a language with a lot of heritage, a lot of um, Really good you things. Can say baggage. <laughs> yeah, but but the interesting thing is some of this baggage is less attached than we thought it was. So the language really is changing, um, and so the the things that we used to need to be able to do with our JVMs ten years ago was we would run it in an application server and we would start the application server and we would leave that application server up for six months because we did not want to bring it down under any circumstances. So yeah. the language needed to be super dynamic. And we like had all of this reflection to allow us to load things. And then we had all of, you know, we had libraries that could come in and out. And we were basically sort of trying to to change the engine of the plane while the plane was flying because that was the business <laughs> requirement. Yeah. But now we're running things in containers. And so that whole requirement to be able to change things dynamically just isn't there anymore because it it you know would just be such a bad practice to try and patch a running container. Instead, you're going to run it through your CI. We're starting and stopping things so Exa so often. exactly. Yeah. Okay, but but we're still sort of paying the tax for all of that dynamism, and mm -hmm. I think we really sort of started thinking about this with ahead of time compilation because I used to work in a JVM performance team. And one of the things that we always got asked was, wouldn't it be great if we could do ahead of time compilation in Java? And the answer was, no, it wouldn't. It will be much <laughs> slower than it is now. You know, it, yeah. it sort of, it seems like it's solving a problem, but really it's not. But that was the you right mean, answer. It would be slower at runtime? It would be, exactly. So it would be, yeah. it would, it would, it would sort of, you wouldn't have the JIT and you wouldn't have garbage collection. And, and you know, it seems like it's a great idea, but actually... It's not because your your throughput is so much lower. Well, the, and but, the JIT is the well. There's many options for the JIT, but they're so mature at this point that they yeah. can do some significant optimizations based on what has been run. And mm -hmm. those that is something that that is really hard to do with ahead of time compilation because yeah. you haven't actually run it. You need anything. to see the behavior of the program <laughs> right. to make that those decisions. So there is a way to do this with Graal VM native image, what we'll talk about. But it, I think that even in kind of their best case scenarios now, they are, they are like close to top JIT performance, but but close to, and it's in, I think it's in kind of very specific scenarios. So yeah, I think generally your point is very true that, that a long running process that is jitted can reach much higher um, typical optimized performance than a ahead of time compiled application. That's a very So does true. Quarkus, so Quarkus is some kind of ahead of time compiler. No, oh, piece no. Of it. Yeah. So this this is where it gets really interesting, I think. Um, and this 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 is something that um, a, a lot of people sort of miss. So this, I think, this sort of they started think. So um, there's an ahead of time compiler called GraalVM, and oh. it now makes sense. Um, and you know, and that's come out um, 
from, you know, I think it probably started in Oracle Labs. Yeah, and years and ago, yeah. in some circumstances, it makes a lot of sense. But the the requirements that it has are quite different from how you would run a Java application normally, because things like reflection will give it conniptions. And so, you know, you have to sort of do a whole yeah, bunch of... time compiled dynamic stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You have to do sort of a whole bunch of work and you have to look at your application and you have to make some assumptions. So there's this closed world assumption, which says at build time, I need to be able to understand what my application is doing, how it runs, what its dependencies are. And so... And does it prevent... I mean, does Gravium just say, oh, you can't do uh, dynamic stuff? You have to declare it. And so, oh. yeah. And so to, to be able to declare it, you can do it manually or Quarkus will, Quarkus understands the structure of your application. And so it can look at it and then generate that configuration for Gravium for you. Oh. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So so you can make an application work on GraalVM, but it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of config. And so what Quarkus does is it takes all of the libraries that you're probably using, things like JAXRS and Har Hibernate, and it makes them work with ahead of time compilation. But this is the bit that's really cool, is in order, in order to, the work that it does to make it work with ahead of time compilation, like looking and figuring out what your application is doing and getting rid of reflection doesn't just have benefits in the AOT case. It has benefits in the JVM case because in most JVM applications, we're paying the tax for the reflection that we're not actually using. That's so right. Quarkus does some of that build time work to say, okay, well, even if you're running on the JVM because you want the slightly higher throughput, I can do a whole bunch of stuff, stuff up front and your application will run much, much faster. So yeah, there's sort of, a, it's a triple win. So um, your application will have higher throughput, it will have faster lower memory startup, consumption, and it will start memory. ridiculously yeah. fast, even on a JVM. Okay, so that's a, an essential part of it is the startup time because we're doing short run cloud services. Exactly. But it's not just the startup time, it's also the throughput, which I think is sort of surprising because normally we tend to think of those as a trade-off, right? And certainly like that's what we get with ahead of time compilation is you're trading off that startup time against the throughput. But with some of the things that Quarkus gets rid of, you actually, <laughs> you get better startup time and you get better throughput. So then it's kind of, well, why wouldn't you do this? Yeah. Yeah. So let me put an example to this that I think is useful. So Quarkus has a dependency injection framework, and uh, the old style dependency injection, the JVM would start up, you'd have you know your main class that would then start figuring out how to wire together all the dependencies. At runtime. At runtime. At runtime. And it would even be doing like bytecode modifications, scanning, scanning the class path, like discovering things, reading configuration, all to assemble this but graph all that should of be static. dependency. Statically known. Exactly. Right. exactly. And so that's, that's exactly what Quarkus has done is said, oh, okay, let's take that resolution of the graph and let's do it at build time instead of at runtime so that then you get all these benefits of lower memory, uh, mm. faster startup and yeah, all sorts of great mm. stuff. And some some deterministicness to that resolved graph because that graph is being resolved at build time. So once you do that build for, let's say, your production system, you've resolved the graph at build time. Now you're sure that when you when you run in production, it's going to be the same resolved graph. So doesn't like Micronaut do that? Micronaut does that. Okay. Uh, okay. Some of that also. So I mean, this yeah. basic idea, but is that a is that like an essential part, or a, I don't know, is that like a core part of uh, Quarkus that it's doing the dependency injection thing, or is that just a piece of many parts? So I think dependency injection is going to be a core part of the programming model that you're probably going to be using if you're developing on Quarkus. And um, a lot of the sort of integrations in Quarkus rely on dependency injection as well. So we've really tried to make all the libraries that we integrate into tie together nicely. And, and often that's done with dependency injection. But there's kind of, there's another bit that sort of follows on too from the, you know, that model that you described of like doing the bytecode manipulation and that kind of thing. Um, we don't, in historically, at, libraries have avoided doing too much of that because it's slow. But there's kind of two more benefits that follow from the fact that Quarkus is doing all of that ahead of time. The first is that when you're developing, 
doing all of that upfront at build time is annoying, um, which is why not, you know most of us don't use natively <laughs> compiled binaries for our everyday development workflow because it's <laughs> it takes you too take long. So what? Yeah. What they've done with Quarkus is they've invested um, a lot of time in. They call it live coding. Um, so it's sort of you know it's it's oh, I'm like so a glad hot you're reload because that's exactly where I wanted to go next. Yeah, and so we have continuous testing and we have um, a dev mode. So when you're running in dev mode, you make a change and then it's instantly available, which is really something really cool. that Quarkus has done so well is really focus on that like inner developer loop where I want to see my changes as quickly as possible reflected in my production system or in my tests that I'm running. And so it's got this hot loop of of rebuilding the code, rebuilding the dependency graph, all that stuff happening, but cache, the caching makes it so that it happens super fast. So I'm making a code change, I save my file, recompile happens, restart happens on my application, my test rerun, all of it just happens automatically, very similar to the way that I've worked in Play Framework in the past, but Corcus has done such a good job on on really nailing that developer experience side of things for that inner developer loop. So it feels like you're almost feels like you're modifying your your running system if it almost feels that so way. almost yeah. like yeah. small talk yeah yeah mm. yeah but, and, but and it's still going through the process of recompiling and restarting and all that yeah okay it's yeah. just keeping all that stuff cached yeah great caching okay. but here's the other piece of this that i think is is so cool and i love that corcus has done such a good job with this is the test containers bit yeah. so oh, yeah. test containers we've we've talked about on on the show before but for those that, that missed it uh test containers is a way to take your service dependencies that you're working against and run those in a docker container and so that now you can get great parity of dev test and prod you can be running essentially the same container across to all those and this is great for consistency it avoids all sorts of issues that i used to have where i'd be running h2 for development but then i'd go to like oracle database for production there were subtle differences between the two and like consistency in this way is really great so test containers allows you to to easily spin up these containers for your service dependencies databases kafka whatever um but what Quarkus has done around this is really great, is they say, all right, you can run your test container. They have test container support built into Quarkus where you say, okay, I'm going to run my app. And my app is going to be in that reload cycle where I make changes and it reloads. But the test containers, you can say, just keep the test container for this thing running. Because why would you need? Because why would you need to restart it? I mean, there are cases where you do want to restart sure. it. If you want to do a like full integration test, you maybe do want to do a fresh restart and you know have have mm, but more control of the life cycle. Doing your exactly, but yeah. when you're do in that like hot inner mm -hmm. loop of development, you just want to keep your test container running. And if you do need to go force restart it, guess what? The Quarkus console has an easy way to just say restart my test container. So this almost sounds like developer productivity engineering. In, yes, in yeah. I, Quarkus has done a fantastic job with the developer productivity engineering mm -hmm. side of things. Yeah, we, we call mm -hmm. it okay, developer sorry, I joy. Talked for a long time, Holly. Tell us your thoughts. Yeah, no, no, it completely. I mean, you, you've you've said it perfectly because yeah, we call it developer joy, and I think again, it's a consequence of it all sort of falls through from that. Let me have a rummage around the application beforehand because there's a whole bunch of things like for most of us when we're doing development, there's so much boilerplate that we have to write, and we don't get rid of it because to do it would be like by code and manipulation and you know it would be slow but because with quarkus it can be done ahead of time there's a whole bunch of things that i think we like would have liked but we just thought oh it's too expensive but now we can have it so i i sometimes think of it as like dynamic but static so you know the behavior yeah. you get is that that kind of real magic dynamism but the performance profile is that it's static and so Best with the you worlds. can yeah you can really see it with the test containers integration because how it works is if I have a dependency, say on Postgres, and I just don't, conf I like, I mean, you can run test containers with anything and it's really nice, but with Quarkus, it's so passive. So if I have a Postgres dependency, all I have to do to run post con test containers is nothing. So if I don't configure exactly. in my config to say, okay, here's the URL for my endpoint for Postgres and here's the password, if I just skip that then you, when i start you just running add one line to your dependency definition in maven or gradle and yeah everything magically happens yeah and then as i run i've got this 
Postgres instance, and it's wired in using the dependency injection. So I don't need to know the coordinates because my code knows the coordinates and that's the thing that matters. And it just works. And then I stop my application and the Postgres instance was test containers and it just stops. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a fantastic developer experience. So hmm. yeah, I'm, before we go on to microservices, um, I, I think there's definitely a transition from Quarkus to, to maybe talk about microservices, but anything else kind of specific about Quarkus that you want to point out that's cool or interesting? One of the things that I've been working on um, more recently is, because um, we sort of, we always knew it was really light and really fast, but we didn't necessarily know, and we sort of thought like that's got to translate into a lower carbon footprint, but we hadn't actually done the benchmarking. Huh. And we've done benchmarking now, and again, we can see that it's about roughly half, depending on the workload and all that, your your carbon footprint with Quarkus compared to if you're going to run another framework. And so again, that's that's so nice because it's nice. so passive. You don't yeah. have to do anything or yeah. you know make these sort of sacrifices or hair shirts. You just get like what is really delightful runtime to use <laughs> and your carbon footprint halved. Right. Oh, and you're cool. talking about the footprint as it's running in the cloud. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the actual like like mm -hmm. cost of execution, energy right. consumption. Mm -hmm. And and that's, that's cool. sort of that's... yeah, it's it sort of links into the microservices because what what a lot of businesses are finding, I think, as they go to microservices is like, I used to have one application that I was running and it was kind of big. Now I have a smaller footprint for each application, but I have 200 of them. And wow, my electricity bill and wow, my cloud bill. And now what do I do? Yeah. So they are noticing. Yeah. A lot more. Because so, yeah, let's let's back up with microservices, just maybe a general definition and also I mean, I first heard about them, I think, through Martin Fowler. Is that something he came up with, or was did somebody else come up with it, or how did how did that happen? Ooh, that's like what pro and also what problem were, were they trying to solve? Let's start with that. What yeah. problem are microservices solving? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's such a good question because I think sometimes we completely forget to answer that question because there's such a sort of an orthodoxy now that like if you know if, if I'm working in an organization and I want to do something that's new and exciting and going to look good on my CV well actually it's not even new and exciting now but if I just want to look not like a lunatic on my you know when I sort of write down on my CV what I did it's always we're going to do this with microservices to show that we know what what yeah. decade it is and we yeah. sort of and why do we want to do microservices well because everybody else is doing microservices netflix <laughs> is doing microservices everybody's doing microservices okay but what problem are we trying to solve with microservices well i don't really know but everybody's doing microservices and then i think what sometimes happens is because we didn't have our eye on the ball of what problem we were trying to solve other than the problem of like I want my CV to look good and I don't want to look stupid trying to defend a decision to not yeah. do microservices. I'm doing microservices because everyone else is doing microservices. Ex exactly. <laughs> um, then, then we sort of end up with all of the microservices and all of the pain that you get from distributing your application. But we sort of forget of like, well, did I wanted to release more fast and that's why I was doing microservices, but right. yeah, actually, yeah, um, I'll, lost, I'll back up like it. lost the, the reason, the motivating factors and we just do it because it's the fad, um, which I think uh, Chris Richardson has make, made a, a yeah. really big point of this is like, no, like microservices are one architectural pattern. And if you're going to choose to use it, know why you're choosing to use yeah. it. Yeah. And, and, and look at the whole thing and make sure that you've got the system, the, the sort of the, conditions for success in place yeah. so I, I um before i was at red hat i was in I, I was at ibm and i was in a team called the ibm garage and we were a consultancy and we helped organizations sort of take advantage of the cloud and and move to the cloud and we had um we had sort of a, a legacy bank come to us and their lunch was getting eaten by the challenger banks and they sort of there was much wringing of hands and why is this happening to us? I think we're not we agile move. enough. <laughs> exactly. We can't move quickly. Then that's yeah. why our lunch is getting eaten. Okay. So what are we going to do to fix this? Okay. So we're going to go to microservices and, you know, can you help us migrate to microservices? <laughs> and, you know, the, the sort of the, the people in the call were like, oh yes, 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 we can help you. And, you know, sort of rubbing their hands together thinking ka-ching. Yeah. And then, and then the bank added, and our release board meets twice a year. 
So at that point, it doesn't matter how many microservices you have, that is the bottleneck on your speed. And so you need to fix that, or at least have a plan to fix that oh, before you re-architect. But so often it doesn't happen. Ah, oh, it's such a good point that so many times we try to shove these architectural patterns into a culture that mm. is not at all conducive to the architectural pattern. It, exactly. And and I think it's natural, right? Like we all, we're all techies. We all hope technology is going to fix the problems and we all want to do the newest and interesting technology because it presents new challenges. I think it's just sometimes with microservices, we may be signed up for more new challenges than, yeah. than we realized. Well, right. So it's an architectural decision. I mean, it's an architectural, like, oh, we're breaking this up because it's easier to evolve pieces independently, right? Yeah. Is that the that, primary goal? I think yeah, scale again, maybe I think is a piece of that too. So, that, so yeah. there's, yeah, the independent evolution mm -hmm. is one possible motivating factor. The ability to scale pieces yeah. of a, a system independently of because uh, in a monolith i think very often when we talk about microservices we have to contrast it to a monolith in a monolith you scale the whole thing right there's not an ability to say okay this service needs to like have a different performance uh, scalability characteristic as the rest of the system and the reason they are independently scalable is because each microservice is running in its own process. Is that correct? Ex exactly, yeah. Okay. Okay, so and you so, can say, oh, yeah. well, we can put more horsepower behind this or we can divide this across multiple processes. Yeah. Horizontal or somehow we, scale. Yeah. Somehow we throw more resources at this microservice. So if you start seeing it as a bottleneck, rather than having to re-architect the whole system to solve that bottleneck you can just focus on the microservice yeah so some so one of the sort of the dreams of microservices often is polyglot so you might say well this thing was written in this language but actually this language just isn't suitable for this use case so this single microservice we can rewrite in a more performant language or an easier language or whatever the the problem is yeah. but I, I think going back to what you were saying about each one being isolated in its own process. I think often there's sort of this idea that if I isolate it into its own process, I've modularized my application. But of course, those two aren't the same thing. You can have a very mm. modular application that runs in a single process, and you can have an incredibly coupled spaghetti nightmare that also has inter-process communication to worry about. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard the term micro monolith. Is that the right one? Where it's like you've you've taken a microservices architecture and turned it into a monolith. And so the the some of the ways to see if you have a micro monolith, and I'm, I think I'm getting that term right, uh, is do you have to deploy all of your microservices at the same yeah. time? Do any schema changes have to be um, essentially? Uh, coordinated across all your microservices um, and so there's some indicators that you that you have a monolithic architecture you just have deployed it as microservices right yeah, exactly. so yeah so you end up with a lot of coupling and what the it sounds like what the trick is is to understand from an architectural standpoint oh here are these pieces that can vary independently yeah and how do you break it down into that and it's you know you're back to just uh architectural design and it gets tricky like yeah, there's sure. there's a lot of places where it's like okay so now i've published a essentially public api of my service and then i need to evolve it mm. how yeah. what does that do to my consumers of this api um how do you not get locked into you know a, a very fixed uh API definition, how do you make something evolvable? And that's where like Rust is is pretty good at evolvable in some ways. Uh, Protobufs is very designed around being being evol an evolvable protocol. Um, so yeah, I think that that's yeah, just one of the things about you decoupling. You can have an evolvable protocol, but then if, as you say, you have to run all of these other microservices in order to run this one, then you've obviously coupled everything. Yeah, very strongly. Yeah, there's there's a phrase that I picked up way way early from somebody, 
and um, sometimes I'm accidentally uh, uh, attributed to it. It's just the idea of separating the things that change from the things that stay the same. Yeah. And it sounds simple and obvious, but that's the trick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the whole, like, how do you, yeah. how do you do that? Well, mostly experience, uh, trying something out and getting data from it and discovering that it's coupled and rewriting yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things um, that Kent Beck has talked about, which I really like as well, because I think like so often the sort of the starting point for microservices is we're going to go to microservices and then we're going to be decoupled. And, you know, it's this sort of <laughs> this theme. And of course it doesn't work like that. But, but Kent Beck sort of says like, not only is that not realistic in practice, it's actually not even the right goal because there's no such thing as a fully decoupled system. Because if it's a system, there is coupling. That's that's, that's why it's yeah. a system. And yeah, so what right. you have to do instead is understand the coupling and manage the coupling. So you have to say, I I am okay with these two services being coupled because I would like them to talk to each other. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. These two systems, I want to be decoupled. So I, you know, I don't want there to be any dependency between them. These two systems, I hoped they were decoupled. And in fact, when I change one, the other one breaks. So I need to go back and understand that this is happening and then figure out what the mitigation or is. Or perhaps you might have these two things and you realize, oh, they're so highly coupled, we should just merge them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I, every time I have to change one, I have to change the other. This is then, annoying. Yeah. Let's merge it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think one of the biggest challenges with microservices is that once you go to the world of microservices, you are building a distributed system. And there's yep. some 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 things that then are some effects of that. So for instance, you no longer can do a real join across your data sets. You know, if you've got a, a company object and a person object and they're in different microservices and different databases, you can't join those two anymore like a database join. Certainly you can, you can do queries on both sides and, and do a join on the kind of application side, but there could be a real performance impact to that. Um, and and then data integrity, like you, you can't ensure uh, foreign key <laughs> um, relationships, you know, across different different data sources. And so this whole world of like, okay, now we are building a distributed system. There's some real trade offs to that. Another one is transactions. Like you know, in a database, you can you can do a database transaction, and there's some ways to try to simulate transactions across distributed data, but it gets pretty tricky pretty quickly. So I don't know th thoughts on the challenges of of building in a distributed system or yeah I mean I th I think I think you've got it said it exactly right and 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 I think part of it too is that we have to we have to kind of understand it and move on and I think the the worst point is when we try and cling to the patterns that made sense for the old world while mm -hmm. we're still operating in the new world and that happens on the process side with yeah. things like the release board that meets every six months but it also happens I think for some of the more um, like one of the things that we always used to talk about is you'd see a pattern where all of the application was distributed into microservices but then there was a single monolithic database so then that became the, right. the thing that blocked the changes and now we've kind of more or less stop doing that. But I think we have a similar thing with transactions where we still really want a transaction because a transaction makes us feel good and it makes us feel safe and it makes us feel like the, we know what's yeah. happening with data. But actually, we just need to move to a new mental model of you know yeah. either sagas or, or whatever. And it will solve some of the same problems, but in a different way. Yeah. Wait, what you said sagas? Saga pattern. What yeah, what is the I don't know pattern. about that. What is that? <laughs> I was afraid that when I said sagas you were gonna ask me about it. And I think yeah, James is well, looking like, like he, he's very, you know, able to talk about the saga uh, pattern. So given the lack of transactions with distributed systems, there has been one way to try try to deal with that called the saga pattern. And um, I'm, I even did a presentation on this a couple of years ago, so I should remember more details, but a lot of those details I've purged out of my brain. Um, essentially, it's trying to give you some of the functionality of a database transaction, but with a distributed system. Hmm. In practice, I think that it 
it's really hard to get right because you're moving yeah. that logic to a coordinator. Like in a in a non-distributed system, your coordinator for the transaction is the database itself. In the Saga pattern, you actually move that kind of into the application layer and try to get it to be that coordinator. And that causes some challenges. So that's, I, okay. I may not be fully remembering all of that correctly, um, but something along those lines. Yeah. And I, and I think as well, it's sort of, you then kind of have to ask the question again about like, what problem are we trying to solve? Like, do I really want to be trying to rewrite database functionality in my application layer when databases <laughs> right. have been so well tuned over so many years? And, and maybe I do because expert. the benefits outweigh the gains, but maybe I don't because this is stuff is hard and it's so easy to get wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that that's been one of the biggest biggest challenges with microservices is that developers are often coming from a crud mindset. And as soon as they start doing microservices, I think they haven't been made fully aware that they are now building a distributed system with a lot of trade-offs. The, a lot yeah. of things that in that crud database are no longer available to them. And so so kind of bringing those CRUD paradigms and trying to apply them in a distributed system is almost like guaranteed to result in a disaster. Yeah. What strategy is used for, well, I'll just relate it to Erlang, where Erlang's approach is, oh, we've got all of these, I don't know, independent components running. And if one of them has a failure, we just kill it and restart it. The supervision. <laughs> yes. Strategy, yeah. Right. Is is that what is normally done with microservices? So I think I mean, this I would think... go into like the Kubernetes control would... plane um, yeah. area, which uh, yeah, I'll let you answer. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think, yeah, I was thinking the exact same thought that at that point, then you're going to need something outside your application architecture yeah. to take care of that orchestration and to take care of... And, and that's another thing that we're sort of seeing, I think, is so we, the the trend to microservices, I think, was really accelerated um, by things like Kubernetes, by things like containers, because it made something that was previously really technically infeasible quite okay, because we could have these lightweight units and somebody could take care of stopping and starting and scaling them. Um yeah. But yeah, so as some examples of that, it's like, okay, so now I've gone to a microservices architecture. Now, what are some things that I need? Well, I need to be able to discover where my microservices are running. Yeah. So that's called service discovery. And they, so you, you just, you need that in a microservices architecture. Uh, and so that's one one piece. Another one is the one that you're talking about, which is the like supervision or the the ability to watch a service, make sure it's functional. If it's not, restart it. You know all that kind of stuff. And so, okay, you need that. Um, maybe you need some centralized logging. Maybe you need. Uh, yeah. So there's, I think, all these different pieces that you need on the operational side, on the deployment side with containers. You need a way to 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 give your unit of work to something to run it um so kubernetes was certainly the 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 big kind of breakthrough in this whole area of okay kubernetes lets you build a microservices architecture with all of this stuff built into it the service discovery the supervision the centralized logging the you know all these different so was kubernetes specifically created to support microservices i think so i i think that that's probably how i would characterize it but I, okay. I don't know holly if you have any thoughts on on that origin story of yeah i mean they, they sort of i think they evolved fairly concurrently um and i think i use i used to have a slide on it so let me see if i can get it right i think it, it was something like the first the first discussion of microservices outside the context of osgi who also had a thing that they called <laughs> microservices but was it was in a single process yep. um it was maybe in 2011 and the first use of um, containers was in 2013. So there's one preceded the other, and now we tend to think of them as exactly the same. But one did come before the other one. I might have the um, yeah the order reversed, but they they're such complementary technologies because yeah. what are you going to do with your amazing containers unless you have 200 applications running in them? And oh, right. how on earth are you going to handle running 200 applications unless you have containers? Yeah, yeah, it definitely. There was some kind of 
incremental evolution of all of this stuff. It's like, okay, microservices sounds great, but wait, how am I going to package up my services and where am I going to put them and how am I going to run them? Um, uh, Netflix did a lot of pioneering work in this area, but did it all kind of against um, Amazon, uh, Amazon's cloud. And then uh, Twitter did a bunch of, of, interesting work in this area with Mesos. And so Mesos mm. was one of these um, kind of early pioneers in this space. And this is really talking about like cluster systems. Like like you, you it was good for you to point out, I'm glad that you pointed out the OSGI systems. And, um, you know, we've had services in our J2EE containers for, for mm. a long time. It's just that that was all kind of very monolithic and the the deployment units were you know jar files and we would run our app servers for a very long time as we as we talked about at the beginning so a lot of these concepts have been around for since long ago with sun um but now i think that that what happened was they moved from java ee to the masses essentially and that required new foundations and so so but kubernetes is very clearly one as being the the yeah. most used foundation underneath all this and with many many layers on top of this and you know, i'm sure you've seen the cloud native uh landscape oh, yeah. <laughs> um chart but but yeah lots of lots of kind of pieces being built on top of it so um do do most microservice systems reside on, I don't know, I guess I want to call them local networks, or is it common to just say, oh, well, we'll put all of these services in the cloud and it doesn't matter where they are. I mean, because it seems like you're adding a whole bunch of latency and <laughs> communication overhead if you do that. What's the, what's the most common way of building a microservice system? That's a really good question. My intuition is that most tend to be in a single cluster um, because you you don't want that network, well, the, the sort of the long distance network latency. And as well, you want um, you want the service discovery and you want the support that your cluster can give you for service discovery. And you also want the support that it can give you for trust. So ideally you're probably, you're going to be running in something that has low trust, but zero trust is kind of expensive and kind of hard to do. So you do want to have some things that say, okay, well, if it talks to me on, on my VPN, on my cluster equivalent of VPN, then I'm going to have fewer restrictions than if it's talking to me from the outside world. I'm okay opening these ports to my friends inside the cluster that I am not okay opening to the outside world. Yeah. And so in, when I was on Google Cloud, um, this is my main familiarity with some of this is that Kubernetes could be set up either as, in a single data center. So you could start up a Kubernetes cluster that would be in a single data center, or you could do it in a region and that would span across multiple data centers. And Kubernetes in in the regional mode will be able to know like oh like that that pod which is the thing that runs something in the cluster that pod in that data center is down i'm going to start it up over in this other data center and so it will kind of manage your availability across the whole region um, for you and region latency is is very low it still is network latency but it's very low but not as low as if it's in a single data center Right. Yeah. Okay. And so there may be workloads that you need to you know, make sure only run in a single data center. That's mm -hmm. going to be your lowest network latency. Um, and then you can get to multi-regional applications. And this is where the distributed data problems get become immense. So you certainly wouldn't want to have a microservices architecture where one network call can go to a node that is right next to you and another one can go halfway around the world. Like that would be a very bad architecture because your latency would be fluctuating tremendously. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to multi-regional, you open a whole giant host of other problems around, around data synchronization, data access, how to create low latency paths to data, caching, cache and validation. Like, like You'd the, want to have the, a really good reason. 
the, for doing that. Yeah. But, you know, if you're a global company and you have customers around the world and you want to provide low latency access to data mm. to all of your customers, like it very well could be a requirement. It's just that the, the data problems become very challenging because of the latency. Mm. Um so around the world, if you need to make a request from the United States to India and back, the like very lowest that you can get with the speed of light is like 80 milliseconds or something like that, which is actually a long time because yeah. in a typical architecture, you're doing a bunch of fan out requests to a bunch of different services and 80 milliseconds is way too long often for, for, um, data, data access. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you then have to deal with that. Where does my data live? How do I synchronize it? Um, how do I do something like a transaction uh, at very high latency? Does eventual consistency work? Like, yeah, the problems just mm. just massively get more complex. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to mention eventual consistency because I, I feel like that's becoming much more popular as an expectation because it's a way of dealing with some of, some of these things. Yeah, so there's been some patterns that have emerged um, to to address some of these these challenges. Eventual consistency is is one, and then there's um, maybe some higher level patterns that are still pretty low level, like um, uh, CRDTs, so conflict uh, conflict resolution data type. No. Com uh, Anyways, <laughs> anyways, ability to converge state to a um, a deterministic point across high latency networks, and so there's uh, there's um, a number of different patterns that people will employ to address these challenges of of multi regional systems, but the complexity is massive. Hmm. Um, one of the I've just recently been reading some articles about the idea of a mono repo is that uh and, and it's this is in a contrast to um i guess maybe it would be um you know what we're talking about here and but but the, the benefits you know they talk about okay so there's some benefits of a mono repo versus um Multi-repo. <laughs> Multi-repo and, um, you know, microservices and things like that, I think. Yeah. Is any of this ringing a bell? Yeah. So I think they're slightly orthogonal because one is about the, the microservices is, is really a deploy time statement and the mono repo is kind of a development time statement. So, mm. so some organizations have a microservices architecture, but they keep all of the source code in one place. Um, okay. And that has some some advantages and it, it does mean that it's sort of easier to at development time get an understanding of what the impact of changes might be or that kind of thing but it also has some disadvantages because you have this huge repo and you were trying to get decoupled and then all of a sudden you're finding that people are poking around in each other's code which wasn't what you wanted maybe or maybe it was and but it, it's <laughs> i think some organizations definitely do the opposite as well, where you have a monolithic deployment, but the code that goes into that monolith is actually assembled from several different repositories. Mm. Yeah, so they can change sure. independently. But if your um, your setup is such that oh well, we don't, that's not really important to us or whatever. We don't need the independent changes. So then maybe we'd have a mono repo instead. Okay. So one interesting thing to point out about uh, my time at Heroku, uh, when uh, Adam Wiggins created the 12 factor app um, patterns, he uh, he had defined one of the 12 factor um, patterns to be, you should have a one-to-one -one correlation between a source repo and a deployable service. And that was part of the 12 factor app. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, looking at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, that's absolutely the only way you should ever do it. But now I'm like, well, maybe sometimes, you know, depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is the that is the learning curve yeah. that we go on. I think I, I sometimes wonder, you know, it seems like a lot of us are attracted to computers because of the apparent determinism of it. It's like 
tell a computer, you know, even if you tell it, if you tell it wrong what to do, it's going to do it exactly <laughs> the way you tell it. And there's that certainty around it. But then the more I look into it, the more it's like, no, um, you know, it's like we thought objects were the right way of doing things. And it's like, yeah, sometimes yeah. Uh, functional yeah. is the correct way of doing things. Eh, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like with the, the certainty just keeps trickling away. You yeah. know, it's. We used to have um, years ago, we had this nightmarish Maven build that was so non-deterministic. I think <laughs> because of how it was handling the dependencies and everything, it just, it would be different on every single developer's machine. Oh, and um, a colleague of mine, Alistair Nottingham, he used to say that, um, Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different thing to happen, which in Maven at that yeah. time, how we were using it was every single time we used it, which yeah. then, you know, you could sort of... thing would happen. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. had a friend who worked, at, I don't think he worked at Oracle for very long because this was so frustrating to him, but um, what they said, oh, well, first thing to do is get Oracle running on your machine and to build it and everything. And what he discovered was that there was like, there were files that would disappear during the build, build process <laughs> and they had a name for it. They called it build lossage. So really? okay, it's, it's under control now. Cause we have a name for it. You know, it's, it's almost like uh, when, when your physician tells you, you have some sort of idiopathic thing. It's like, yeah. that means we don't know what it is. So if you expect non-determinism, then it makes it okay. Right. Apparently. <laughs> and, and it was expected that it would take a couple of months before you could get it to build reliably on your machine. And you're just thinking, I mean, this was years ago. So, you'd think it had gotten better, but you know, if it was that bad, yeah. would it, mm. would it, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't instill a lot of confidence yeah. in. It, it goes uh, to show. Wanna... Go ahead. It goes to show to you the importance of having new people in your team. Cause it sounds like it didn't get mm. fixed in this case, but often you have those things and everybody just sort of gets accustomed to it of like, Oh, of course I have yeah. to do this. And then someone Works new on comes in and goes, what is this? How can you live like this? Yeah, we need to sort yeah. this out. And then that's what yeah. makes the change happen. Stockholm syndrome. For well, I think in this case, he <clears throat> left after six months or something yeah. because it was just too insane for him. Yeah. So I want to switch gears to talk about protocols in microservices. Mm -hmm. So I think by far the most used one is REST. Um, I've also played with gRPC and, and it, you know, it's interesting. It has some interesting advantages to it, but Speed, yeah, mostly, right? Um, there's, the, there's a few things on gRPC. So one is bi-directionality. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it opens an HTTP2 connection and so then you can talk both ways. I think that has some usefulness. But you can use it locally um, without doing that, right? Can't you? It's, an, it's a network protocol. Oh, okay. gRPC is the network protocol. Protobufs is the serialization protocol. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. Yeah. And then so Protobufs is the usual um, serialization underneath gRPC. And so that has some, some advantages on on the size of the data and some, some things. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know, Holly, I'm curious your take on, on microservice protocols. Like is, uh, I know Quarkus has great support for rest. Um, what's the, what is the rest, the, the kind of, uh, reactive rest library, uh, stuff in, in Quarkus? It's, um, rest easy. Rest easy. Yeah. Yeah. So they yeah use, and it's yeah, nice, rest, like rest annotation easy, driven, um, reactive and, and all that. Um, yeah, what's your take on, on protocols and, and you can relate it to Quarkus or not? Yeah. So, so it's not something that, um, I'm embarrassed to say I have not yet tried gRPC. It's one of those things that I sort of, I keep thinking, yes, I really must get around <laughs> to this. And I, I think I'm going to have to, um, soon because yeah. I've, one of the things that I've been working going back to sort of microservices in general is, um, I'm a big fan of contract testing. And so I've been working on getting sort of a really nice integration for the Pact contract testing framework into Quarkus. Um, and Pact has just recently expanded to have plugability so they can, they, you know, they're sort of 
by default REST, but now they have plugins for things like gRPC. And so I want to make sure that we have a good integration for that with Quarkus and Pact. Um, so yeah. when I get around to that, I will have to try gRPC. But yeah. it's so I think it's for all of us, isn't it? It's so easy to you sort of get into your swim lane and, you, and your, yeah. your comfort zone and you say, well, I know how to do this and I have a deadline, so I'll just keep doing well, rest this. is so the de facto standard <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah what's the overhead difference between uh rest and grpc i'm sure someone has done some benchmarks mm -hmm. it may depend heavily on the the form of the data and the the type of call the frequency of call and because just so off the top of my head it would seem like rest would be significantly more Add, add significantly more overhead versus gRPC. I I don't know if that is true. I mean, JSON is definitely not the most compact format, but it's also not terrible. It's not and XML. that's not necessarily the bottleneck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, it may. It may <coughs> I funny. have heard of systems that spend like seventy five percent of their CPU time just parsing or generating JSON. And so that mm -hmm. definitely could be a performance like bottleneck there, depending sure. on, on what your system mm -hmm. needs to do. Um, but I think for a lot of use cases, yeah. REST is totally sufficient. Yeah, so. that's another one of those it depends things yeah. which you start looking at because people, people look at some things. I've been looking at a lot of um, uh, criticisms of object-oriented programming. And like there was one where this guy was building a game and he was going, oh, the, you know, the cash misses and the everything caused by, and it's like, okay, for your use case, yeah, obviously yeah, it's a real problem. <laughs> but then there's other systems where it's like, oh, the speed of being able to put the system together is the bottleneck mm. and not the performance. You know, mm. it's like, no, the performance is fine or yeah. more than we need or whatever. And so it's always kind of coming down to this. Uh, yeah. It yeah. depends. Know There's what, know what problem you're depends. trying to solve yes. and measure, yes, don't guess. What, right. Yeah. 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 So Holly, you mentioned contract testing. Tell us about that. Cause I don't really know much about contract testing. So contract testing is something that, um, I think, again, it's sort of, if you're thinking about microservices, you should be thinking about contract testing, but because it's relatively new, um, I think it's not as widespread as it, could be or, or should be. Um, and it what it gives you is, so when, when we're doing um, microservices or when we're doing testing in general, normally we would do a unit test and there we would mock our external dependencies and our tests run fine. And I think the sort of the, the promise of microservices was I only need to focus on my little service and as long as my service functions correctly, everything is okay. But what we often see, of course, is that the the devil is in the details and the the real, because a microservice system is such a complex system, the, the dynamics, the emergent behavior of the system is actually on what happens between those services, not mm -hmm. what happens within the individual services, because those services can be tiny. Yeah. And so, so a single service can think that it's functioning perfectly normally and, and doing what it's supposed to do. But then when combined with other services, then things don't work as expected. Exactly. Going back to your question about the protocol, it may be that the, you know, the, the protocol is different or worse yet, the protocol looks okay if you look at the sort of the fields and that kind of thing, but the semantics aren't right. And so then mm. you get a problem. And so what 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 sometimes people do to try and look at the emergent behavior of the system is they stand up all 200 microservices and then they run end-to-end -end tests. But of course, that's incredibly expensive and incredibly annoying. And if we yeah. wanted to stand up 200 services, we would have just stayed with a monolith. <laughs> right. And so then you end up with various solutions. So, you know, we, we're seeing now sort of things where you have a remote call environment where you you do your local development, but someone else has stood up 200 services in your platform engineering right. team and you do that. Or yeah. you get sort of the the testing in production where you say, actually, it's just too hard. As long as I can <laughs> respond quickly when I see the catastrophe in production, that's okay. Um, yeah. And what, what microservices um, contract testing does is it tries to be sort of a middle layer that says, it's going to give me more, a lot more confidence than unit testing because the problem with unit testing is I bake my assumptions about what the other service does into my test. And yeah. so then if those assumptions are wrong, nobody actually tells me that. Yeah. And so with, with contract testing, what you have is you have something where it's a, you write a contract, which 
could be, you know, a JSON file or whatever. And for your service that you're developing, it acts as a mock. So it says, okay, yeah. you know, I, I write my tests and I can just run against that mock. For the other service, it acts as a functional test. So you get that connection between the two, but with the performance profile of unit tests. So nobody has oh, to stand cool. the two services up. Yeah, it's so really what the, nice. So what the consumer of the service, when it's it, – there's a agreed contract between the two. The consumer of the service is testing against that contract, but then the the producer of that service is also testing itself against that contract. So that's how you how both both sides know that the other side works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so you can do um, what what you sometimes get then is sort of contract first, which is like an extension of test driven development. Yeah. So the idea is that I'm going to write my as the consumer, I'm going to write the contract and I'm going to write my, you know, use it as a mock for my thing. And I'm going to share my contract to the provider and the provider will just write their stuff to work against that contract. And yeah. so it means that it, you, you get the sort of the, the Yagni where they don't have to spend their time writing stuff that I'm not using. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and then is, are these contracts defined in open API or swagger or something? Or what's the usual... Language yeah, so there's a few different ways that you can do it. Um, so you can do uh, a lot of teams do open API contracts, um, and that has a lot of advantages because open API is such a widely used ecosystem. I think um, there's some disadvantages with open API because you tend to get the syntax checking, but not necessarily the semantics yeah, there. Yeah, so yeah. you don't really get that kind of deeper thing of, okay, well, if I pass you, Alice, I expect you to pass me back, Bob. And even yeah. if you pass me back a JSON object oh, right. that has, you know, a name and an address, but yeah. it's Fred, then yeah. that I, that wasn't okay for me. Um, yeah. So that's where something like Pact will come in. So that gives you that slightly deeper, semantically aware testing. Huh. And so then I'm guessing, and maybe you already said it, that Quarkus has pack support. So if I want to start building some microservices and doing some contract testing, I can do that with Quarkus and pack. Yeah, it's it's, it's new. Um, so what I've done, I, something I've been working on, because I have a, <laughs> ever since my consultant days, I have a, a thing for contract testing because it's saved, huh. it got me out of trouble so many times. Yeah. Um, so what I've got now is I've got it so that the Quarkus continuous testing will work with contract testing with Pact. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and, and what I want to do next is go in and add some of that boilerplate removal and get some of that deeper integration so that it looks at what else is going on in your application and says, okay, I think based on how you're using this, you're going to want your contract to look like this. So let me save you a bit of boilerplate and let me just yeah. generate that for you. Oh, cool. Hmm. It seems like contract testing might be something that, because you've done so many presentations on um, microservices, it seems like contract testing could be a rich mind to vein for presentations coming up yeah yeah i've got a few coming up on it um but i think one of the things that with contract testing that i really sort of i want to investigate and understand more deeply is pact is um like if you read a book on microservices it will say do pact contract testing but then if i go out and i talk to people and i say you know so hands up how many people are using pact you know there's sort of one or two people and then huh. everybody else is sat on their hands so then the question is okay well why aren't why people yeah. doing this and i think part of it is that it's hard and you have to talk to the other team in order to <laughs> negotiate how you're going to do your contract cultural testing challenges. and we all thought that by doing microservices, we didn't have to talk to the other team because if right. everything broke, it was the other team's fault and we could say we were That's blameless. Right. And so then there's yeah. some of this, it sort of brings back, I think, some of those home truths of microservices yeah. that like, this is still a system. We do have to care what other people are doing. We do yeah. still have a coupling and let's try and front load that coupling and get it at development time via contract rather than discovering the coupling at production yeah. time when it's really much more problematic. Oh, there was this fantasy that, that by doing microservices, we could ignore that other teams existed. And yeah. it turns out that that is um, going to put you into a world of hurt uh, at some yep. point. And, and you actually do need to communicate with other teams. And what a better way to communicate have as a, a um, basis of communication is a contract that you both agree on and have to derive together. And you both have to validate actually you work with. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. And I, th- I think you're right. I think that's why Pact maybe isn't as popular as it should be is because it breaks that fantasy. Yeah. Um, but then with Pact, like the thing that's so good about it is both sides get something out of it. So it's not just like, because I think when we say contract as well, you sort of imagine lawyers and you think, oh, this is just going to be tedious and painful. But it acts, it saves the consumer writing a mock. And writing mocks yeah. can be re- really time consuming and tedious. And you yeah. try and write yeah. a test and then you, you've spent two days writing your mock and you still don't have a test. Yeah. Or, you know, and not on the other side, then it does some of the functional testing. So again, writing functional tests is expensive. And if you get some of that coming in for free, yeah, that's a win. Yeah, that's great. I could also see maybe a connection between um, Eric Evans' domain-driven design stuff and contract testing. Like, like, is could you use domain-driven design to define your contract? And maybe be interesting. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Stuff. That you. Th- yeah, well, especially to talk about. I mean, do we need objects, or can we <laughs> use structures? Yeah. I, I feel like. Data-driven design, I mean, uh, domain-driven design produces structures as well as, yeah. you know, it's it's like, it's looking at the data, really. Yeah. And maybe... Well, and the data is defined in the contract, like the mm-hmm. shape of the data is defined right. in the contract. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. I'll have to explore that. Yeah. Mm. Um, Cool. Well, obviously, I don't know if we've explicitly said it, but Corcus is great for microservices. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that, but uh, thumbs up for me. <laughs> um, cool. Anything else on microservices? I'm out of out of questions. <laughs> Holly, anything else from you? Um, no, I think I think I'm out of commentary. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, on thank you so much note. for joining us. Yes, oh, thank, thank you for you. inviting me.